Hello everyone, this is Susan from Learning Times again. Sorry about that, I forgot to mute my other computer, but I, I am delighted to introduce today's Pro Series webinar. And um, our leader today is Ed Rodley from Peabody Essex Museum, correct Ed? Correct. And I am going to let him take over from this point. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as Susan said, my name is Ed Rodley. I'm the Associate Director of Integrated Media at the Peabody Essex Museum, and I'm uh, also a member of the board of MCN. So on behalf of uh, the entire Museum Computer Network, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope that people uh, will, as Susan said, make active use of the back channel. One of the things that we like most about um, this particular format for doing professional development is that it really does give you a chance to be much more hands-on even sometimes than in a face-to-face -face workshop. So make use of the chat box. If you're following along, uh, feel free to tweet stuff. Susan and I will both be monitoring the back channel and using that as a way to try to feed your questions and comments to the presenters. Um, Susan, can you put up the slide with the agenda? Just to give you an idea, uh, we'll get the housekeeping out of the way as, as soon as possible. Uh, just to let you know how the next couple of hours are going to go. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about MCN, give you a plug for the conference, uh, as well as for the one remaining workshop still in this series. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our three presenters and how awesome they are, uh, and then give you an outline of what each of them are going to talk about. Um, one of the things that we have, uh, a change that we have made in the format of this presentation um, is we're leaving time at the end specifically for you to ask questions of the presenters um, about whatever your particular dam's issue, question, or comment is, um, which I think is a, an exciting change we've made from the beginning of this workshop series. So um, without further ado, MCN Pro is something that the Museum Computer Network launched this year um, as part of our commitment to trying to provide sort of year-round professional development. Um, in, in years past, we've been much more focused on the annual conference, which is still obviously sort of the, the pivot around which the whole year at MCN rotates, but we're trying to make it more of a year-round uh, effort to provide you with the skills and training that people are looking for. So we are very, very interested in your comments afterwards about um, how this particular workshop has gone. Um, is it pitched to too high a level, too low a level? Is the format something that works for you? So I, I encourage everyone to not be shy about uh, telling us how it went, because we're, we're actively looking at what the next series of workshops should be like. So now is a great time for you to give us your feedback. Um, also, uh, in other MCN news, um, we are hoping to have the preliminary program up for the annual conference. So for those of you who have not been uh, looking as far ahead as November, you should start scanning your calendars now because MCN 2013 will be coming up uh, in scenic Montreal, which is a, both a great place to be and a great place to go to a conference. Uh, so I would check in at the MCN website in the next week or so, and you should be able to see what the preliminary program is going to look like. Uh, and I, for one, am incredibly excited about the proposals that I've been seeing coming in, so I think we're going to have another really solid agenda. Okay, so that's all the MCN bookkeeping out of the way. So on to our uh, bio sketches of our three presenters. So we are lucky enough to have with us today uh, Mark Check, who is the director of, uh, let me see if I get it right, Mark, is it Interactive and Information Technology or Information and Interactive Technology? Uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other. But there we uh, go. Yeah, Information and Interactive Tech. There we go. At the Museum of Science in Boston, a former coworker of mine. Uh, Mark has um, great experience to bring because he's actually implemented dams in a couple of different institutions. Um, so we'll be, we'll be looking forward to him telling us, uh, particularly about sort of thinking about scoping the big issues um, around how a dam fits into your larger information architecture within an institution and um, coming up with RFPs. Uh, we also have with us Claire Blackman, who is my coworker here at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. Claire, Claire is our brand new digital asset management system manager. Um, Claire comes to us from the publishing world, so if you if you think 
the deadlines and things that you deal with in a museum are, can be crushing. Claire can probably disabuse you of that notion. And then lastly, we have with us Heidi Quicksilver from LACMA, um, who is their digital asset management, oof, God, digital, bleh, digital asset management system manager, and is one of the people behind LACMA's incredible uh, offering of high quality images that you can download and do what you want with, um, which is very exciting okay. for the field in general, I think. So Heidi will talk you through uh, the end, uh, the back end of the process, once you actually have a dam system, what does it mean to actually work in an institution that has one? What are the workflows? Who are the people involved? How do you actually structure it so that it makes your life easier rather than harder? Okay. And then, as I said before, at the end, we're saving the last half hour. So all of the presentations will be over in time for us to have a solid 30 minutes of people just asking the presenters questions about dams. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to give you the answers, but it's your opportunity to talk to three people with a, a broad range of experience using dams um, about whatever question it is you have. I'm assuming most of the people here are uh, in the process of thinking about a dams or they're in the process of soliciting uh, quotes from vendors. Uh, so we're, we're happy to try to help you out in whatever way we can. I don't think you're going to get much in the way of specific product endorsements, like use product A over product B. Um, but we'll do what we can. Before we do that, though, I forgot the polls. Uh, Susan, can we go back to the polls for a second, just so we can have a chance to see who everybody is? Okay, so where's the first poll? Okay. And then, so let's look at what kind of museum do you represent? Okay, so not surprisingly, heavily into art and history museums. I'd be interested um, for people who clicked special to um, give us a response in the chat window, what counts as special? Ah, OK, Botanic Garden, yep. That was definitely not one we put in our category list. Uh, natural history, sure. OK. Let's move on to the, the second poll. Um, one of the things that we were seeing as you people started selecting answers, um, no publications people, and surprisingly few straight up IT people. Um, Mark, I, I know that you had uh, you had commented on something when you, the poll results were coming in. Anything you want to chime in on? Uh, no, not necessarily interesting group. I think we had zero IT folks when we were looking at this earlier. So at least we've gotten some, some numbers there now. Right, I think between the other and mixed group, it looks like we've got a pretty broad representation. Um, all right, and then our last poll, at what stage are you in your relationship with dams? Um, not surprisingly, it looks like half of you are still in the dating stage, and another 30% are in the it's complicated stage. All right, so nobody, uh, at least nobody's looking to get rid of their dams. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think it's it's good to get a sense of where everybody is coming from before we begin. That way, the presenters can tailor their talks hopefully a little bit more to where you all are coming from. So, without further ado, Mark Check from the Museum of Science. Take it away, Mark. Great. Thank you, Ed, and welcome to everybody today. 
And uh, just a little bit about my history, as Ed mentioned, I've been with a few different museums and consulted with other museums. So uh, even though I am from the Museum of Science currently, I have worked for children's museums and history museums and uh, done some work with art museums as well. So it, it's good to see the variety of museums in the audience here. And I think that, uh, you know, a, a pretty common theme that we're going to see today is as we look at digital asset management systems, I think, you know, the size, the type, the culture of the organization is going to dictate quite a bit about how your particular institution decides on what type of a dam you need and how it's going to be used within your, within your institution. So as Ed mentioned, I'm really going to start out talking about kind of the big picture strategy areas here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the points, but hopefully just kind of lay out um, some of the big picture considerations. And then I know as Claire and Heidi move into their sections of the presentation, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll dig a little deeper and provide a little more granular detail uh, about some of the things that I'm talking about here in the first set of slides. So that said, um, before embarking on any sort of a dam project, you need to ask yourself a few things. And the first thing is, what is the big picture? So I've been in many museums, um, and sometimes the idea of implementing a digital asset management system is the brainchild of a few people. Sometimes it's a strategic institutional uh, project or priority. So you really want to get yourself centered on what you're trying to do. Um, a big difference in museums is often what you're trying to manage with digital asset management. Now, the obvious answer to that is you're trying to manage digital assets. But what I have seen in many organizations is the assets are really secondary to other things that are trying to be managed. One of those are people. And um, you know, being in technology in museums, we're often put in the position of using technology to manage people and to manage processes. Um, if you haven't really used a digital asset management system, this may be surprising to you. But the reason I mention people is because I've been in institutions and consulted with other institutions that have had to implement digital asset management to kind of cut down on misuse of different digital assets. Uh, you know, a good example of this might be that folks in certain departments are using unvetted or uncopyrighted digital assets and publishing them or perpetuating them to the public. And uh, you know that's an example that we're talking about here. It's not just about managing assets, but it's about managing that workflow and the people and the processes around it. In some institutions, um, you know, when we talk about non-copyrighted imagery um, or not having rights to those images, we're also talking about compliance. So are you complying with copyright? Um, so, so think about this a little bit before you really jump in. Are you just simply trying to manage the assets and the tagging of those assets, or is there a larger cultural issue that you're trying to manage as well, and how does that fit into your strategic planning? The other thing I've found in museums is anytime we're trying to implement any system, but I think this is particularly special when it comes to digital asset management, is this an institutional or a divisional endeavor? And by that I mean is there this top-down need that the organization has for digital asset management, or is it really a departmental or a divisional need for asset management? And if it is a departmental or divisional need, are you looking at trying to extend that out to a wider scope within the organization? Um, and that will make a big difference in how you approach um, bringing in a dam. Um, you have to ask yourself, are you fully committed as an institution, or are you really just trying this out in a small group to see what works and how it works, and then scaling up from there? So those are some of the big picture considerations you want to have before moving ahead. Being responsible for technology resources in museums. Um, I also wanted to mention that you want to think, as you're looking at options out there, about what internal resources do you have to support a dam. And there's a couple of different types of resources. One of them near and dear to myself is the technical resources. So do you have technical staff that can help bring up, implement, maintenance, upgrade a system? This will have a bearing on the type of system that you want to invest in. So IT staffing is you know, certainly
certainly a consideration. But beyond IT, we're talking about infrastructure. I mentioned here network bandwidth because more and more museum uh, collections in many museums are moving from relatively uh, small file size imagery and documents to things like video. And as we're starting to move video back and forth over internal networks or to cloud-based systems, network bandwidth becomes a huge priority as well as storage. Um, we hear a lot about the term big data out there in the wild right now, but it's no different in museums. It's one of the things that we're struggling with, and I think many museums are struggling with, is this explosive growth of big data. And uh, even if we look at our collections, we're finding that a lot of our collections for many museums are becoming digital in nature too, as more of our cultural assets are inherently digital. So, you know, look at your staffing, look at your bandwidth, look at your storage, and then at the end of it, even if you're able to store all of the assets in your system, is there an existing backup or disaster re recovery strategy for your institution? Um, the last thing you want to do is store a bunch of digital assets into a centralized system only to have some sort of epic hardware failure and to lose all of those assets and all of the hard work that you've put into them. Um, so certainly consider your technical resources. This will have a large bearing on how you move ahead. And then aside from the technical aspects of this, there's really a human aspect. Um, assets do not manage themselves even if you have a tool to manage them for you. And I think this is one of the areas I've seen museums really struggle with and have trouble with in the past. Um, it's not one of those technologies where you put it in place and all of your assets magically move themselves into the system, tag themselves, categorize themselves and decide on their own permissions on who gets to access, uh, access them and in what way they get to access and use those assets. It's really important that you have a human factor in there to be able to manage the assets in your system. Um, one of the great benefits about a digital asset management system is that we can tag those images for easy searching and categorization and, and pulling them out of the system for different uses. But that has to be tagging that's done by a human and in a way that makes sense. Many organizations, and one of the things I'll warn about, have um, tried to do this by utilizing interns, by utilizing volunteers, docents, um, because it's a cheap way of getting labor to be able to get assets into the system. The problem is with any transient workforce or workforce that is not really tenured and has a great institutional knowledge, it's very hard for them to accurately tag and label the type of assets that you're putting into the system. So one of the things I'll put out there up front is besides technical resources, make sure that you are thinking reasonably about the human resources that it's going to take to manage a digital asset management system. So I thought this particular graphic um, you know, was appropriate for the next step here. What is a dam? And I, I think everybody here can agree that when we refer to a dam, we're talking about a digital asset management system. But coming from the technology perspective, that can mean many, many different things. It's very ambiguous. If we look at the classic definition of a digital asset, a digital asset is any item of text or media that has been formatted into a binary source that includes the right to use it. So we... Um, you know, as we look at it from the IT perspective, basically anything that resides on our systems in binary could be a digital asset. But I think when most organizations look at digital assets, they are not necessarily considering everything within the scope of, of digital data within their organization candidates for residing in the system. Um, we, within any museum, there are tons of images, tons of sound files, video files, a lot of source code for things we're developing any type of document, from office documents to PDFs to you know, web documents, you name it. Um, so, so there's a scope issue here that we have to deal with in terms of what you're trying to use your digital asset management system for. And to make matters worse, there's a lot of different names out there that are used for specialized types of digital asset management systems. Um, so you're just looking at a list here of you know, digital content management, enterprise content management, media asset management. Uh, in museums in particular, we always kind of get confused between our two CMSs. So what's a content management system and what's a collection management system? Um, I'm sure 
most of our audience being in museums, uh, you, you have your own collections management system, and the digital asset management system that you're talking about is probably looking at a different scope of assets that it's going to house than your collections management system. But I have worked with museums as well that have looked primarily at using a digital asset management system for their collections management system. So I mention this because I think it's really important to decide what your particular flavor of digital asset management you're trying to accomplish with the system. Uh, what systems are already in place, what work for you, and what are you trying to rein in using the system within your institution. And then at the end of that, if you have incumbent systems that are already housing them, do you want to integrate them with the digital asset management system? Do you want the digital asset management system to house a subset of, of assets from another system? Is it completely mutually exclusive in terms of the types of assets that are going to be in there? These are the types of things that you need to think about as you move ahead. So with that said, I just want to talk about the different steps that you should really go through. And these will be gone into in greater detail with Claire and Heidi here. But step one, define the scope. So what's really driving the business need? Is it a departmental need? Is it a divisional need? What are you really trying to accomplish? Um, is it a you know, purely technical need, or is it a cultural need that you have? Define the type and nature of assets. So going back to my last slide, you really want to decide what is within scope and out of scope for this particular system. Define the maturity of assets. And I mention this because most organizations, when they implement a dam, are faced with a backlog, a lengthy backlog of digital assets that they would like to get into the system. But it probably isn't realistic that they're going to be able to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's probably not realistic that they're going to be able to get all of their legacy assets into that system. So you have to ask yourself, are you really just going to start using this digital at asset management system moving forward, or maybe going back a year in terms of your most critical digital assets? Or are you really going to try to go back in history and gather in all your existing and incumbent digital assets into the system? And if so, you really have to consider resources appropriately to do that. And then, of course, define the division's departments involved. Is this you know, something that we're doing in conjunction with IIT and maybe your marketing and communications? Or is this purely a collection um, endeavor? Or is, is it your entire institution? So these scope uh, definitions are very important to get out there up front. Step two, define your stakeholders. And this is partially done as you define those departments. But by stakeholders, you want to define your consumers and your divisions. So who's actually going to be using the system as a consumer? Who's going to be looking into the system, um, browsing your assets? Who's going to administrate those assets? Um, so who's going to be putting them into the system? Who's going to be making the choices about how those assets are tagged? In some cases, you may be using your consumers or your community at large to tag those. But define permissions. Um, this is the security around your system. So uh, some people may have read-only. They can browse, and then they have to request an image from you. Some of them um, you know, may be able to go right in and download and use at their discretion any asset in there. But you really want to make sure that you define all the roles of the people in your institution who will be accessing the system in one way or another. And don't forget IT. And I just throw this out there after working with IT for a long time, that they are a major stakeholder uh, in terms of making sure that the system is running appropriately for the administrators and the end users of the system. Um, step three, define your ROI. Now, when I look at ROI, or return on investment in museums, it's different than in the business world. We generally look at it two ways. It can be marginal, which means there's, there's a financial return on investment that you get out of the system. It could be in terms of really streamlining processes and cutting down on staff time and effort uh, to be able to do something. But there's also mission-based ROI. Um, it may cost money to do it, but it advances the mission of the institution or allows you to free up bandwidth to do other important things mission-related for the institution. But make sure as you're going through this process, you define what that return on investment is. And in that, there's some technical and resource considerations. Is it going to be an open source system? Is it going to be off the shelf? 
Are you going to self-host it on site, or is this going to be hosted out in the cloud as software as a service? And do you have the capacity internally to do backup and disaster recovery? I mentioned these in the ROI slide because these are all potentially costs um, that will be incumbent upon the institution um, you know, in forms of infrastructure or IT staff. So you really want to look closely at the ROI. And then lastly, you want to develop an RFP. And I put a big question mark next to this because we have moved largely away from doing RFPs for vendors, for software. Um, it, we still do them, but I think when you do an RFP, it's mostly to get your institution heads um, cumulatively around what the goals of this particular software is, what the ideal implementation is. The reality of RFPs right now is vendors rarely read RFPs all the way through. And if there are vendors in the audience, I apologize if you're one of the rare few that actually do read RFPs nowadays. But what we often find in software is they get a cursory glance, and then it's followed up with a phone call where the vendor wants to show you all the great bells and whistles um, about their software. So I think an RFP is important to develop, but more so for internal consumption and internal clarification than for the vendors. And realize that this doesn't help necessarily with some of the open source DAM platforms out there as well, because you don't necessarily have salespeople or presenters that can help you. What I suggest and what we've been doing successfully for a number of years is rather than sending out a formalized RFP to vendors, we generally use our own internal RFP to develop a survey format. So asking very straightforward functional questions about the software, about the platform, um, and usually publishing that online for them to be able to answer so that we can easily aggregate all the answers from different vendors. Um, if you use fluid surveys or um, SurveyMonkey, it's very easy to kind of translate something that you would normally have into an RFP into a survey. And we found that this is a great way to really approach vendors to have them answer very directly the functional questions that you have about their platform before bringing them to the table for a demonstration or an on-site visit. And uh, I know Heidi and Claire will elaborate more on um, many of the things I've talked about here. But I believe, and Ed, tell me if I'm wrong, I think we have a few minutes maybe for some Q&A before moving on to the next set of slides. I know we're running right on schedule. So if, if people have Excellent. particular questions, chime on in. I see a couple of good ones that people were asking about, uh, about training and um, if you are resource limited in terms of the people you have, you can dedicate to uh, being the human asset who are going to code all of your data. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm trying to take a look at where these are. I, I, I see a couple of questions in the presenter chat here. Um, it looks like uh, Dale from Santa Fe says, there is, a, is there a problem with an iterative bottom-up approach? And um, and I think what we're talking about there is really, you know, can you start with a bottom-up? So, and I've done this before, maybe in one department, implementing a system and kind of testing out, you know, how it works, maybe what sort of tagging we're using, what sort of permissions we're using, what sort of assets we're putting in there, learning quickly, you know, what works and what doesn't work or what might be problematic, changing that policy, changing that methodology, rolling it out again on a small scale, and then as it becomes clearer, um, you know, the best practices for that system kind of scaling up from there. And I think, yes, I, I, I don't really, I see more benefit to problem with that type of approach in many ways in many institutions. I think that's a great way to go about it. By the time it gets out to a larger audience, by the time you have more stakeholders, um, you've solved a lot of the initial problems that might be inherent in the system. Um, looks like another question here. Um, McClung Museum, what if your only option for consistent dams labor is intern labor? Um, <laughs> that's a big problem. Um, I think for the most part, you can use interns to get assets into a system. Um, and they can take care of a lot of that workload. What I would personally avoid, and, and I think probably some of my other co-presenters can speak to this from their standpoint, is I think it's dangerous when you get to tagging and the taxonomy of the assets within your system to have interns doing that because they often do not have 
the perspective um, of, you know, for instance, if you're using a photograph, what space is this? What exhibit is this? When is it from? Who are the people in this exhibit? Um, I also think to that point, one thing I didn't mention, but when uh, you talk about a terminology or a taxonomy behind digital assets, you really should define a vocabulary that makes sense to everyone, uh, that, that's a consumer and a user of the system. And by that, I mean there may be a terminology, you know, one of the examples I'll use is um, if you want images, perhaps, that you're using that show diversity, you should know that anytime you have an image that has diversity, diversity should be a tag that you actually use in that. Um, so, you know, interns might be able to get away with a bit of work in terms of getting objects into the system. If you have a defined taxonomy, might be able to do some work um, doing a good job of tagging those assets. But um, I, I think when it comes down to really good tagging and terminology, relying on interns becomes hard. And that's maybe the point at which you want to turn that responsibility over to a, a staff member who has a little bit more insight. And I think to, to build on that, one of the comments that Dale made in the chat window, I think about the difference between long-term volunteers and interns, um, that, that might be another way to try to approach it, because uh, I, I agree with what Mark is saying. Um, that, that persistence and that long-term um, knowledge and understanding of what's important to the institution, I think you might be more likely to find in your dedicated long-term volunteer staff than you would in an intern who's going to you know, maybe be there three months, maybe a year if you're lucky. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are ways, I think, to try to minimize that, but for all, for all of those people, the um, the necessity of having somebody who is on staff who is figuring out um, the training of those staff, regardless of whether they're interns or volunteers or paid positions, um, and figuring out things like, okay, what is what is your taxonomy going to look like, uh, becomes really crucial because if you if you build it without having really thought that through enough, then you're liable to wind up in trouble. Absolutely. Um, Ed, I think we're at the time where we move on to uh, next presenter. <laughs> it, seems that, it seems that way. Uh, um, one thing I would just want to add. For folks, um, if you've been busy trying to uh, copy all of the slides or, or do screen caps, we will make the presentations available afterwards on the site so you don't have to. You can put your pens down. Um, all of those things will be there for you. Okay, so um, let's move on then to the second presentation, which will be Claire Blackman from the Peabody Essex Museum. Uh, Claire is going to talk a little bit more uh, nuts and boltsy about the things to think about before you actually get a dam. So identifying your needs and figuring out what are the decisions that need to be made so that you can actually put together a system. Claire, you want to take it away? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the Peabody Essex Museum's first digital asset manager. This was a new position they just created. So I am currently right in the process of getting our dams up and running. So I'm going to talk to you about kind of that before part, where you're identifying your needs here, and then you have to make final decisions about what dam it is that you're going to get. So the unofficial job title is actually, boy, are we glad you're here. I hear <laughs> yeah. that a lot in meetings that Claire winds up going to. Yeah, I also get all the third-party rights for any asset that people have been wanting. So everyone's very glad to not have to do that anymore. Uh, okay, so let's talk about some prerequisites. Uh, I'm assuming, if everyone here is from museums, I'm assuming that everyone has a collection management system. Uh, having that sort of thing would come first, because you need to manage your physical objects before you manage the digital assets that are maybe attached to them. So I'm just going to assume that everyone has a CMS. Uh, you know what? Claire, let's yeah. just take a second and give people a chance. Is, does anybody actually not have a CMS of some sort but is contemplating a dams? If you do, let us know in the chat window. Okay. So uh, Mark talked briefly about this. So do you have a digital strategy? You want to think about why are you getting this dams and how will it help you achieve your goals as an institution? What is it that you need to do? 
So then you should define who will spearhead the project. You need somebody who's going to be in charge of this, who's going to keep it moving along. Because it would be really easy to just let it bog down and wallow in research, wallow in, oh, do we want this, do we want that? So I think everyone on this panel would recommend that you get a dedicated digital asset manager and you know, either somebody from your staff or someone that you hire specifically for the purpose. I know that not everybody has that option to get somebody new. I know it was a, a big to-do to get me on board here. So I'm grateful that they did that, but I know it's not for everybody. So define who will spearhead it. If you need your asset manager, if you have a small committee of people, maybe someone from IT, just who is going to be in charge? All right, so here's kind of an overview of the process that I'm going to go through. These first four here, uh, to talk to your users, to talk to other institutions, identify your needs, and conduct research, these are all ongoing simultaneously. They're all kind of, you know, you do a little of this, you do a little of that. Maybe your needs, you realize they're different as you're doing your research. Maybe you want to research a specific kind of dams that you found out about. These are all preliminary things that go on together. And then the next steps are to hold small group live demos where the vendors come and show you what they have. Then after that, you want to hold narrow field demos for your top two or three choices for a wider audience. You want to keep that first group really small uh, for the main stakeholders for the dam. Then after that, uh, you write your request for proposal if your vendors are going to require it, and you get the funding for it. So, when you talk to your users, there's a twofold purpose here. You're getting information from them about what they need and what they want and what they currently do, but I think also very important is that you're educating them about a dam. What is a dam? People might not know. They might not understand why you're putting in all this effort for it or why you're putting all this money into it. Uh, this is a time to get buy-in from people in your institution. When you have your dams eventually, you're going you're gonna to need people to use it. You're going to want them to be willing to go in there and do your processes and you know, understand that this is a thing that actually helps them, that makes their life easier. So when you're talking to your users, it's important to keep in mind educating them will make your life easier. All right, so here's some things you can ask them. Uh, figure out what departments use digital assets. And it, it may be more departments than you think. You know, we have a bunch here. I was surprised that uh, development needed assets because uh, they have to put them in grants for you know, exhibits that we want to get from other places. So yeah, ask around, what, what departments need digital assets? What kind of digital assets are they going to use? And what are they going to do with them? What's their current system for managing digital assets? And their current system can be really as simple as we make a folder on the server and we put the images in a specific kind of folder. So, I mean, that's a system, and it helps them. But you're going to try to upgrade that. So the question is then, what would they want or need in the dams? What would be kind of their ideal thing to do? And also think about public users. If you're going to have any public-facing assets, if you're going to uh, release high res to the public, if you're going to let researchers in to see, if you're going to let community members see what's going on, see pictures from uh, events that you've had, uh, it might be worth talking to them. You know, what does the public need? So that's talking to your users. You also want to get in touch with other institutions that have similar asset management needs to yours. And I want to point out that this is not necessarily just museums that are of the same type as yours, not just the same type of art museum, uh, not just the same size of museum, but things that uh, have similar asset management needs. So uh, Peabody Essex would probably have more in common with the Museum of Science on our asset management needs than it would, say, the Met. I know they have a very large licensing department, which we, we just don't need to have that kind of thing. So the deal with talking to other institutions is that you want to get the consumer reviews for them. They, that's valuable insider advice that you can get. If they have a dams, which dams do they use, and how do they like it? You know, are they going to, do they want to get divorced from their dams? Are they in a happy relationship? And also important is how is the provider support team? You know, they can promise you the world. The vendor will be like, oh, we can do this, and we can do that, and we'll do it super cheap. 
but how did the reality turn out? How is it going to be, you know, in six months, in a year after the implementation? Are they still a good support for you? Are they support when something goes wrong? Okay, so we're going to identify your needs. And again, this is ongoing. It will change, it will evolve, depending on what your strategy is, depending on what you, the scope of your project is going to be. So ask yourself, what kinds of assets do you have? And what kind of assets are you going to have? As we talked about, there is a big switch to video. So that will take up a lot more space on your servers. Uh, how many assets do you have? Will you have in the future? Do you have a big digitization plan uh, program going on? Will that add a lot of new assets for you? What do you want to do with those assets once they're in your DAM? Do you want to publish them? Do you want to edit them? Do you want to archive them? I have a big list of those coming up. And then think about who your end users will be. Will it be uh, researchers? Will it be community members? Will it be different departments? What departments within your institution? Who is going to make use of these things and what for? Oh, you can also, an end user would be the press, if press needs images from you. So here's a list of some different kinds of assets and actions you can do with them. Uh, as we talked about, it's very obvious to have assets like images and video and audio and text files. But there's also things like programs. If someone's written the interactive kiosk, then you can have that program available. Or design files for promotional materials, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, and then actions, things you can do with them. Search, I think, is clearly the most important one. You want to you manage your assets towards something. So you want to be able to do it for these actions. And searching is just really key to finding what you want when you want it. So consider that for sure. Archiving, uh, you can help preserve if you have really old things that are you know, better left digitally so that people can look at them without bringing them in the sunlight, all that stuff. You can do things like publish them to a blog. You can view them. You can attach metadata. All kinds of great stuff that you can do. And you don't have to do all of these things, of course. You shouldn't try to do all of them. But consider which ones are best for your needs. OK. So then the question is, what kind of data do you want to keep on these assets? And oh dear, come back here. So I think an important distinction to make, especially in the museum field, is you have several different levels of this data. So first of all, you have your object data. If I have an iron throne in my collection, then I have all this data on the actual object itself, the iron throne. But then I also have the image of the iron throne that we took. And that has very different information that you need to track for it. You know, not the, not the year that the throne was made, but the year that the, or the date that the image was taken. And you know, not the dimensions of the throne, but the resolution of the picture. You have your object, you have your image, and then you also have rights data. You should put, you know, who owns this thing? If it's in your collection, then you own it, yes. But if you have an image, it can be, you know, sent to you from a third party for an exhibition that's coming up that they're lending to you. It can be some work for hire that a photographer's done for you. So keeping track of what images you can use for what, what assets are allowed. I think that's a very important part of a dam that I want to you know, make sure that everyone knows to integrate. Um, because when you don't do rights correctly, then that can lead to legal issues. And that's definitely something you want to avoid. So that's another reason it's important to get buy-in so everyone realizes that, yes, rights are a thing. You have, your, you have these assets, but you can't just use them willy-nilly. You have to you know, look it up. And it's important to have a very obvious centralized place where everyone can look up what the rights are to use for particular assets. And then you also have related or derivative images. So we have a picture of the Iron Throne here, but it's also got the cast with it at the opening of the exhibit. So this is probably, if, you're, if it was at your museum, this would be owned by your institution, taken by your photographer. It still, it still has similar needs for an image data, you know, when was it taken, who's the copyright for, what's the credit line, that kind of stuff, all the rights for it as well. There are also, uh, and you want to link it to 
maybe the object itself so that when someone looks up the Iron Throne, they can see, oh, here's all these great promotional potential pictures we took of it. You know, check it out. Check all these things together so you don't have to go searching through for each one. And then you can also have derivative images, which are, for example, if I had this photo in a very huge original size, that would be more limited to, say, creative services, someone who's doing photo manipulation. But I could have it at a, you know, a medium size for web, a smaller size for giving out to the media. You could have a, a 300 DPI for the print. If people are making a catalog with this image, so that's what I mean by derivative images. And those are just smaller versions of the same thing. Whereas related images are images maybe that are related and somehow to the object if you're going to base your, your search system on the object. All right. So Mark also talked about what existing systems does a DAMS need to integrate with? Definitely your content management system. If you're licensing these things out, uh, do you want to integrate it with a billing system in some way? Think about your servers, how much space you have, how much you're going to need in the future, what your backup is going to be for those. And also mobile devices. Do you want people to be able to access this on their iPads? Do you want people to access it on their phones? Do you want the public to be able to access it on their iPads and phones? That's great. Uh, there, yes? there have been a couple of interesting questions in the chat about people um, talking about public-facing systems, and also, mm -hmm. um, if you look, um, Kathy had an interesting question about the differences between the different kinds of ways of storing data, like a data repository versus a dams versus a data warehouse. Do you think you could mm -hmm. um, maybe elaborate a little bit on those two? Um, yeah, I think it really just depends on what you're going to be doing with the things that you're storing. Like I said, you always want to manage towards some kind of goal. So if you want to just keep and archive your images, or your assets, I should stop saying images. It's definitely just about assets. Uh, then I guess a, a repository is, is better for that kind of thing. Uh, a dams would help you do, there are a bunch of these. Let me, let me go back to, to my actions. Uh, so a dams would be more useful for a variety of these actions, whereas a data warehouse, I think that's more for security, I would think, right? I'm not really familiar with that term. But yeah, I would say, especially if you're talking about public-facing things and uh, permissions are going to be very important, like what are they allowed to see? What size and image are they allowed to see? Are they allowed to download anything? Whereas if it's more internal, then you have to think about what size of image are they going to need for print, who gets to who gets to kind of be the gatekeeper of these assets, that kind of thing. Does that answer the question? I don't feel like it really did. I'll try. Is there anything else I should address, Ed? Those are the two that came up while you were talking. Okay. Well, let's go back. Pyramid images. Okay. And then, existing systems, okay. I just want to speak briefly about uh, the difference between open source versus proprietary systems. So there's a lot of kind of myths surrounding what open source means. And the real definitional difference between the two of these things is that for an open source system, the code is free as in speech. Like you're free to see it, you're free to modify it, you're free to work with it. And that doesn't mean there aren't going to be restrictions on it. You know, it might still be licensed. You might still, for example, it might have a restriction on it that you can't resell it to somebody else, that you can't, that you have to credit a certain institution or person when you're using it. Whereas in a proprietary system, the, cl the code is closed. You don't get to see it. You don't get to alter it. Uh, if any altering of it is done, it's by uh, the vendor. So another, another myth about open source is that it's always free. And that is, I want to disabuse everyone of that notion right now. Uh, open source code, it, an open source system might be free, or it might cost up front. But even if it is free up front, it's like what, what we like to say is free as in kittens. You see a, a box of kittens by the side of the road, and yeah, you can take one home. But you're still going to find yourself 
paying for its upkeep, its maintenance. You got to feed the kitten. You got to train the kitten. Uh, you got to make it pee in the right spot if it's not peeing in the right spot. So there's always going to be there's always going to be costs associated. There's never going to be just straight up free. So when something goes wrong, and it will, something will go wrong every time. Uh, your options for open source are usually more community support. You have a large group of people who are you know, working on this code, who are familiar with the system, and they can kind of come together to support and answer your questions and help. Whereas in a proprietary system, you get contracted support from the vendor, from the business itself. So that, of course, means that a proprietary system has a lower technical commitment versus an open source, which would have higher technical commitment. So just think about what you have at your museum by way of resources to put towards this. So that's open source versus proprietary. You can also just do some straight up old fashioned research into this kind of thing. There are uh, sites online where you can purchase comparisons, kind of a consumer reports thing, uh, report between different dams. You can look to the provider websites to see their demos, to see how they're selling themselves, what features they offer. There are plenty of journal articles and white papers as well. Uh, digital asset management has been a field of study since I think at least the mid-90s. So there are some great articles out there. There are some great papers on this. There are also some case studies. Uh, when a museum is putting in a new digital system or implementing a new digital strategy, sometimes they'll post an article about you know how did it go? What did we do? What were we trying to achieve? Did we achieve it? So these are all things that you can research, you know, towards getting some ideas about what you might like or how you might like to do this. All right. So once you've done that beginning part, talking to your users, talking to the institution, identifying your needs, and doing research, then it's time for some small group demos. Uh, you can see the products in person. That's very important. Uh, you know they. Again, they'll promise you the world, and it can look like one thing on the website, but you want to see what it is that you're buying. So you want to limit these small group demos to people who will be the main DAMS users, the main stakeholders. And you want to come prepared with your needs, even you know, give it to the, the vendors beforehand so they can know what they need to address with you. And use the reps' knowledge. Ask them lots of questions. Think of what questions you need to know in advance. What couldn't, couldn't you figure out from doing your other research? So once you've seen a few of the uh, wider demos, then you want to narrow the field to your top two or three systems. You don't want to do any more than that. You don't want to give people too many choices, because you know how it is in the grocery store. You have so many choices, you just get hamstrung on it. Uh, similar here, you want to be able to provide a very clear, you know, here are our top two, what do you guys think? You present those to the wider institution. Uh, get a representative from you know, every department that would have a stake in this. And you want to be able to present them with the pros and cons, too. Because you're the one that's been doing all this research. You're the one that's been thinking hard about what the museum needs. And they haven't necessarily. So if you can tell them, you know, here's what we like and here's what we don't about each. And it's important, I want to say, that you, know, you should let yourself, you should let people have their say about what they want or what they feel. But don't feel like you need a system that pleases everyone, because it doesn't exist. You know, there will always be someone who's just like, mm, I don't really like this. I want to hold out for this one that my brother works on in Minneapolis or whatever. You know, don't worry about pleasing everyone. You've got to be able to find something that works for you that most people can get on board with. And that's why you, you know, have a specific leader to your head people for this project so that you guys are the ones that have the most knowledge. And in the end, you're the ones that can make the recommendations. So once you've seen those, uh, here are some other things to keep in mind. You're going to have to migrate your data. You're going to get the data into the system somehow. How are you going to do that? What is that going to cost in uh, time and money? Think about your security or otherwise known as permissions and access levels. Who gets access to what and when? What are your processes for getting access to things? Uh, we talked about hosting. It can be cloud hosted or self hosted. There are pros and cons to each. Uh, when you're thinking about long term compliance, think 10 years max, because then I need the speed that these Technologies are moving now. Ten years is about as far as you're going to get in the future. But you do want to think for those ten years. You know, is this still going to be good? Are we going to have enough space? Are we going? To, is it going to meet our needs going forward? Staff commitment. We've discussed as well. We have to make sure everyone's on board. 
make everyone sure everyone's willing to use the stamps once it's in, that everyone understands the purpose of it and why it's here and how to use it. And then we didn't talk much about budget because it's just it would range so widely. Budget would really depend on your institution, the size of your institution, and also on the kind of system that you get. But here are some things, some aspects of this to think about when you're thinking about the budget. There's the licensing fees, of course, in order to you know just get it to begin with and to you know maintain it. You want the implementation? How much is it going to cost to get into your system to get the migration going? And then ongoing maintenance. You know, make sure that you have backups. Make sure when something goes wrong, it can get fixed. Uh, if you see some problems with it, then you're like, hey, can I add this extra feature? Can we add this uh, new data slot? So those are some things to consider when you're considering the budget. So then you should be ready to make your decision. You know, what DMs are we going to get? And at that point, uh, you write the RFP if you need it, and you get your funding. Right, that's the easy part, right? Just get funding. Just get a grant. We all good. <laughs> That's the easy yeah. part. Mm -hmm. Hey, Claire, oh, yeah. could, I, could I ask you one question about um, doing doing your demos? Yeah. Uh, so if you're if you're thinking about open source versus proprietary, I mean, one of the one of the problems I have is that if you if you go with a proprietary system, then you can call up the vendor and schedule a demo. But if you're looking at a, at an open source project, that you don't have that same resource of yeah. having the easy point person to go to to say, you know, come in and show me, you know, fill in fill in the open source system of your choice. So in that situation, how would you go about trying to make sort of an apples to apples comparison um, where, you, where you don't have the, the slickly put together um, easy presentation that you would get from a proprietary vendor? I think what I would do is I would sit through a couple of proprietary vendor presentations and see, you know, what is it that they cover? Uh, what's involved in that kind of presentation? And then go back and do as much research as you can into the open source system and say, all right, can I put together a little presentation on this? And it, of course, won't be as comprehensive as you know, a professional salesman coming to show you it. But you can cover some of the same pros and cons that you think about this. You're like, well, this can, this can help us in this way, but its limitations are that. And uh, I think the deal is just to show everybody what you're thinking about and kind of get their input on it to make the decision. You know, is this mm -hmm. going to help them? Do they see some? If they see some serious problems with it, then they can let you know. I think that's what I would do. Uh huh. Okay. Just Thank you. Process overview so everyone can look. Yeah, but that's that's what I wanted to talk about. So hopefully that can get you from hey we want a dams to now we know what dams we want. All right. So at that point, let's uh, let's open it up to questions in the chat for people for Claire. I know one thing that you've mentioned a couple of times, Claire, is the importance of this kind of um, horizontal coalition building and, and information sharing. Um, and I, I know there were a couple of questions that had already come up in the chat with uh, with people wondering the extent to which other people even understand what the heck a dams is for. So, yeah. uh, what do people think about? the need or how one goes about actually uh, making it clear to your organizations why this thing is a good idea? Well, the way I've been doing it is uh, it to get buy-in is going around and being like, hey, you know, you guys, you guys have needs. You need images. You need to make sure that you're using them correctly. I want to make sure that everything I give you, you know, you can get in good time, that you can know what's available, that you can use them properly so we can avoid lawsuits and avoid problems. And I think everyone gets on board for that. If you talk about it more in how can this help you rather than, oh, we're going to get a proprietary system and we're going to have this kind of metadata and we're going to have that kind of server. Like they, people don't care about that kind of thing. What they care about is how will this help them perform their job better? How will it give them access to assets that they wouldn't have had necessarily or wouldn't have been able to find? That's how I would phrase it. Uh, so I think this is sort of getting to Dale's question that he raised about um, what are the value adds in terms of strategy and program that, that a dams provides. Could you could you talk a little bit, Claire uh, um, and Heidi or Mark, about specific um, institutional benefits that you see from your, the dams implementations that you have lived through? 
I haven't answered sure. one yet, so I'm not, I'm not sure if I can qualify. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think I can hop in the Museum of Science in implementing a dam. You know, for us, the um, the real benefit was really the return on investment in terms of efficiency. Um, the methodology that we had for searching for, finding, vetting um, images mainly for publications and for marketing purposes is a pretty cumbersome one. Um, in some ways, it still is, but we were looking at a return on investment, you know, just simply in terms of efficiency and, and not spending our time on kind of the uh, menial task of, of digging through literally, you know, CDs or a, uh, you know, shoebox uh, <laughs> full of uh, hard drives, um, you know, to, to find images. Um, in other institutions I've been in, uh, you know, the return on investment for this has not so much been efficiency as much as it's been control um, about making sure that if people want to use images for purposes, these are vetted, approved, copyrighted types of images. Um, so in, in our particular cases, I think those are the, you know, two areas um, where they've been strategically um, beneficial. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, this is Heidi, if you can hear me. I think um, I mean, the, the biggest benefit for most people in an institution is the fact that they suddenly have access to all of these assets that they never knew existed because somebody was controlling them somewhere or somebody had them on a CD and nobody, nobody knew so you're opening up your archive of assets so that they can be used. They're no longer kept in a back room. They're no longer hidden from everybody. I'm not saying that hiding them was the original intention, but access to them was never available before. And then, so that's, that's the majority of the staff, but then what you get from the people who had the assets also is a control over them where they can issue or tag or add into the metadata images that are approved and can be used. You can add copyright information. You can add credit line information. You can add um, keywords about what's being shown in the image, you know, whether it's collection or non-collection. Um, you have the, more of an ability to control what is used as well because before, if you had some massive server that somebody just dug through in their spare time and found an image that they thought might work really great for a marketing brochure, but they don't know where it originated, they don't know where it came from, they don't know who's pictured in it. Um, none of that information was ever associated with that image before, and now it can be, so they'll be able to know, hey, yes, I can use that image, or B, no, I can't use that image, or there's something about it, you know, or it hasn't been approved, or hey, I found this image, who do I contact in order to get it approved because it doesn't have any information on it either. Does that help? That's, some, that's something we run into all the time with, with leg legacy digital assets. Um, right, absolutely. The, oh, we, we made this video for this exhibition and now we want to show it on the local TV channel. Um, we made it, so we must be able to use it, right? No. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> Without the dams, um, right. The, the, if you want to really spend just a really frustrating day, I advise any of you to go find like an old, old multimedia presentation you've done and try to identify where every single still image in it and sound file came from. Uh, even like a two-minute short video, um, it can really just completely ruin your day if you don't have some way of easily finding where all that information about the information lives. Um, you know, for me, one of the many reasons I am very glad that Claire has been hired is being able to have that repository so that we know going forward, you can go back a year later and say, okay, what are the rights we have on these things? Um, and actually get an answer is, uh, it's so much more efficient and it makes for such a less painful workflow for everyone involved. Absolutely, yeah. but I also want to throw in on that is that the data doesn't magically appear. And this goes back to um, the conversations that we're having and the questions that I saw coming up is that having a person that manages the system and the 
assets in the system has to have in some way add that data, whether that data is coming from your collections management system or whether you're putting that data directly into your asset management system, it has to be entered by somebody. It has to be organized by somebody. It has to be vetted by somebody. There has to be somebody doing that work, um, which is, again, you know, why I say that using an intern to run your asset management system is probably not your best option. Yeah, especially okay. with a couple more questions um, about linked open data and dams. Um, There's that great paper that came out today that I saw today. Oh, the, uh, the, Mellon, the Mellon Foundation report. Do you have the URL mm -hmm. on that, Andy? Um, I'm looking for it. Okay, if you find yeah. it, can you just put it up in the chat window? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Susie had a question about um, just going back over basic understanding of different kinds of repositories. Claire, do you want to address that one? Uh, those components correctly. CMS is needed to manage the physical artifacts. Is that the one? Yeah, that's that. I think that's yeah. the one that was referring to. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I'd be. Yeah, I, when I say CMS, I'm more referring to collection management system because that's what we have at the museum. Um, we, you can use you can use your CMS as a dam. Like there are there are CMSs out there that have that kind of capability where you can, you know, put digital assets in it. You can link them to the objects. You can just use them as their own objects. Like we talked about, there's this the object itself, and then there's the, the picture of the object as its own object, too. So let's see. Yes, the, the collection management is for physical artifacts. The dam manages the digital assets. They can overlap quite a bit. They can work together. Uh, yes. And as far as does the dam manage the website, I don't know. It can. I talked about publishing as a thing that you can do with a dam, but I'm not sure about the process of getting it from your system onto, say, a blog or something like that. Does anyone else have any experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to address this question because I think this is one area in museums where things get muddy and confusing and kind of refers back to the original piece I talked about where there's no real defined terminology. Uh, around what a dam is, or even for that matter, what a collections management system is, because I think they're very dependent on your type of collections, your utilization of it. I, I think addressing this particular question, she's absolutely correct. I mean, there's a lot of potential overlap between the systems. You can have a collections management system, and, and let's face it, a collections management system is a digital asset management system in many cases. You can have digital artifacts and objects in a collections management system um, and manage them in certain ways. Likewise, you could use a digital asset management system to manage collections. And some smaller museums especially have, have done that. I think the defining point between the two is that collections management systems are a little more industry specific in terms of the types of fields and, and baked-in capabilities that are common amongst museums, whereas digital asset management uh, systems are not. But depending on the system you look at, there can be overlap. Likewise, they can, these can be used independently of one another. So your collections man management system might be specifically for collections, but your digital asset management systems may be just for internal assets, for instance. And this is probably the way I've seen most museums do this, is digital asset management is for really kind of your own internal um, assets, but the collections management system is for the collections. But then likewise, so I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I, I, have a, I have a different view of that. Yeah. I, see a, well, I see a definite difference between a collections management system and a digital asset management system. Um, as, as because my digital asset management system feeds outward. It feeds, um, it's not only an internal um, system for people within the museum to use, but it feeds our collections online as well. Um, our collections management system is the absolute number one authority on all information that is related to the collection. Period and the collection objects as well as exhibition objects, etc. 
And our collections management system is linked to our digital asset management system because we have digital assets that are linked to um, the information from the collections management system. So an object may have, will have one record, but that one record will have many media assets that can be attached to it. Um, and that, can you give that, an example, think, Heidi? Um, well, so you have, um, it, even if, if you have a painting, the painting is going to have one record in your collections management system, and that painting is going to have all of the information that is um, pertinent to that object, artist title, date, tombstone information, but it's also going to have insurance information, it's also going to have exhibition records, it's also going to have um, conservation information, it's also going to have anything that really legally and importantly has to do with that object itself. In the asset management system, I may have 20 images that represent that object. I may have a full-on image, I may have a front, a back, a detail, I may have alternate views, I may have exhibition images where it was installed in the gallery, I may have whatever, and those are the assets that I attribute to that object. In the asset management system, my tombstone information for that object for artist title date um, and maybe the size of it, et cetera, the, the probably top five um, metadata fields that people use the most. However, if they want all of the decent, not more well, decent isn't the right word, if they want the extended information about that object and all of the things that it's associated with and then that is always going to come in the form of the authority of the collections management system. And it is read-only information that is pushed into the digital asset management system because, I, because it's, you need to have one authority on the artist's title, date, and you know, all of that type of information so that in the digital asset management system, you're not changing that information about those objects. But then you're also, in the digital asset management system, you have the ability to add additional information that is useful about the asset itself. That it doesn't necessarily coincide with the object. So maybe you have a photography of the object that came in from somewhere else that might have a different credit line or a different copyright or a different whatever. The object has one copyright, and that usually belongs to the museum, unless it's a loaned object. But the assets themselves may have, if you have 12 images, you may have five different copyrights depending on who the photographer was, whether it was in, the image came from the museum, whether the image came from an outside source, whether it was, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's media level information that needs to get documented and tracked and filled in for the assets themselves that is not necessarily object level information. And that's where I see the difference. Yeah, can, you I mean, give, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I wanted to ask a question because I think you bring up a good point and one of the ones I was getting to is that I, I, I think in many cases digital asset management systems linking with collections management systems are often making up for, you know, perhaps shortcomings in collections management systems. I think one of the things I hear a lot about is moving subsections of your collections to a digital asset management system to be able to deliver them to the web. And I think you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, yeah, I think it speaks to a certain shortcoming in a lot of the collections management systems. The other one you've brought up is, you know, multiple copyrights for different types of imagery. I guess my question back to you on that, just plain devil's advocate, is if your collections management system had the ability to deliver these things to the web in the same way the digital asset management system does, if it had the ability to keep track of multiple copyrights and, and different types of assets within the collections management system, might you think about just simply using the collections management system solely for these purposes? Or is there more of we, a... We research oh, I, collections management systems a lot. Um, and we actually just switched to TMS at the end of last year. Um, and TMS is not 
a digital asset management system. It is an, an amazing collections management system, but it doesn't have the robust capabilities that an asset management system has for capturing specific data. Right. Yeah. About one of the, the, one of the things I'm running into now nowadays is we generate lots of digital assets that don't easily tie to objects in the collection. Um, right. So for example, right. when we were just launching our blog, um, you know, the, the people putting it together are looking for interesting images to go along with posts. And when you find things like a, an, an action shot of an installation in progress, there may not be a single object to tie it to, so it would live easily within a content management system, but at the same time, it is very definitely related to this particular project. So there are there are whole classes of digital assets that we routinely generate that don't neatly fit within the CMS. Right. So, so for us, non-collection objects for us. Right. I, I think in the interest of Susie's question, too, I want to make sure that we're not taking a, a, a confusion and <laughs> making it even more convoluted and confusing. You know, I, I think, you know, when you ask the question of, you know, integration between your DAM or between your CMS, hopefully what you're hearing out of this is I think it really is dependent upon your particular organization, uh, how you handle, handle your collections and your assets overall and what your kind of incumbent tools are and what your goals are. I mean, I don't think there's a one-size-fit-all answer um, no. to whether these are mutually exclusive, whether they have an overlap, or what that overlap is. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I think this goes back to Claire's point that she made a couple of times about yep. what are you managing towards? What, what, is, what is your goal for wanting to try to lasso all of these assets and be able to easily use them? Is it mainly to streamline internal processes? Is it to make some sort of public-facing Interface. If you're if you're you know the Reichs Museum doing the Reich Studio, you have a very different set of requirements than if you're just trying to, um, you know, bring together a bunch of different repositories in house and be able to manage your rights internally. Right, and I mean I guess the other thing that that I really want to pinpoint and address is that. There are collection-related images, but there are so many non-collection images. And then there are exhibition images, which are a muddy middle ground sometimes between collections and non-collections, because a lot of the time the photography doesn't come from your institution. It comes along with the object render. You know? and then it, but then it's also going to come with render rights and restrictions that may be different for, than exhibition rights and restrictions that may be different from object or artist rights and restrictions. And then there's media, depending on who, media level rights and restrictions, depending on who um, photographs the object as well. So there's, I mean, there's so many different types of information at a media level that you need to keep track of that is not something that I have found any collections management system to do successfully. I think that I, I think that there might there's a huge market for maybe a collections management system that can be a hybrid digital asset management system, but I would say that um, it's probably it doesn't exist currently. So okay. On on that note, I think. Um, why don't we move on to our next, the third of our presentations, uh, since. Doing, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, I would love to. I'm, um, All right, so I'm, without I'm further ado, <laughs> Heidi Quicksilver from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art talking about implementation. Go, oh, Heidi. Thank you. I might cruise through some of this, actually, because it has already been addressed. And I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the great questions that you guys are, are um, presenting to us, which some of them I address and some of them I don't. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, ultimately, so you bought a dam, now you have to make it work. And I'm not going to go too much into how to configure your dams. That's entirely an individual institutional choice. But I'm, I'd like to provide some guidance, I guess, to you and some things to ask in some um, specific areas that would require focus. And 
I'd, I'd like to open up as much time at the end for more of your questions and 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 help you work through some of the things that you're that you feel that you're actually up against currently. Um, so first and foremost, you need to establish your project team and your project team for your implementation is not necessarily going to be your same project team that existed during your research. Um, it, it can be. It may well be. You may have some of the same people. But you also need to consider that now you have to bring, you have to loop your vendor into your project. Having a, um, Having a vendor that you can work with in a partnership is a, is a very, very helpful tool for implementing any type of asset management project. Um, your project manager hopefully is going to be your DAMS administrator. Your stakeholders are going to be the people who own the project for their specific sections um, or, or departments or parts of your museum, uh, however your organization is structured. The power users you need to bring in, and they're going to be the staff that you predict will be the main strong users of the system. They're the ones that you're going to want to do your testing of your beta when, it's, um, when you first put it out. They're the ones that are going to be able to have the most robust reply, I guess, for, for when you say, does this work or doesn't this work or do you wish it did something different? They're probably going to know if they wish it did something different. Um, and as Mark said, IT staff. You absolutely have to be on the same page with your IT staff because they're going to handle your technical configuration, your storage, and it, they have to be listened to the, the project from the beginning. Um, and again, back to your vendor and your vendor counterparts. Just as much as you have a project manager, your vendor also has a project manager. Just as you have some IT people on your team, your vendor also has some IT people on, on their team. And to be able to be on the same page and to be able to connect with all of these people on the same level is going to move your project forward faster and easier. Um, and I'm going to reiterate this. I know that we've gone through this, but I just need to say it one more time. Um, hire a DAMS administrator for the project and system management. And I understand that smaller institutions are going to have a hard time um, setting up a full-time new position. And it doesn't necessarily have to remain a full-time position, but it does in the beginning. Um, the system is not going to run itself. And you need somebody who can bridge the gap between your IT people, your users, your vendor, and your institution. Somebody who can act as a translator because your power users are not necessarily going to understand the IT limitations as well as um, your IT people and your developers may not um, work with the vendor liaison, which is something that I think a DAMS administrator needs to be your project manager, your DAMS administrator, is going to be the liaison for the communications of the whole entire group or everyone that is, um, that's invested in this. The DAMS administrator also, beyond managing the project, is someone who manages requests for assets, changes to the system, can guide and develop user-facing functionality, can run your beta testing with your pilot group, and control roles and permissions, and logins, and point, be a point person for your vendor, can also do your configuration of your assets in the system, arrange your assets in a way that makes sense to everybody, so that they're searchable, usable, and they're not placed in digital storage and never again see the light of day. The administrator is a very, very, important role um, and something to consider. It's, I, I can understand having maybe some tagging or some keywords put on some volunteers or interns, but the management of the system itself is, is extremely important. And it's a full-time job. Um, beyond your team, 
once you have your team, your team needs to unify on an approach for your implementation. Um, an iterative approach versus the Big Bang approach. Big Bang is pretty simple. You put everything in the system all at once, and you work through it from there. Um, the iterative approach, I think, usually is going to work best for most institutions. The Big Bang approach might work well in some smaller institutions, but I think the larger you have and the more stakeholders you have and the more assets you have, um, the more complicated the Big Bang approach would be. Um, it does do a little bit at a time. So, you, know, you can have your first beta test as your V1, and then you work through a small set of data to see how it's working. Or maybe, um, as Dale from Santa Fe said earlier, that you, know, that you start out with one department, and then you work through the kinks with that department and that department's assets before you um, move to the next one because you can learn so many so much more when you're actually when you actually have your own assets in a system and you're actually using them and you're actually making the system work for you. Um, and you can start small and then you can add more and then you can add more when you work up some of the kinks along the way. Um, you might have a first iteration, a second iteration, possibly even a third iteration before you launch to your entire institution. Um, but also, I guess the iterative approach works best when you find resistance to change or slow adoption to new technology um, within your institution in case maybe there's you know, or you feel that there's a larger amount of training needed or a longer training period needed, um, you can take things a little bit slower when you when you use an iterative approach instead. Um, step two, document your wants, needs, and expectations. The best way to think about this is to focus on solving some known problems, not focusing necessarily just on specific features that you require from your vendor or from from your from the system. It's best to learn how people are doing things now and document how the system will work for them in the future. Um, as far as what they see as a problem and how do you see the possibility of solving it with your asset management system. Satisfaction is a function of expectation. Uh, part of the implementation process is going to be to align everyone's expectations. If you're working with many different departments in your museum, then each department may have a completely different idea about what they think a digital asset management system can and will do for them. And it makes the most sense to align everyone's expectations from the beginning about how things are going to work and what is going to be available. Um, RFPs and requirements are different. Your RFP, um, stated one thing earlier in early in your process, and you've probably been well educated since the RFP was written, you need to redefine the needed functions in context of an overall system and clearly define what you mean by users, what you mean by roles and permissions, what you mean by assets, what you mean by metadata fields, categories, searches, et cetera. First and foremost, as everybody before me has already said, talk to your users. Um, you may be surprised that their needs and uses for assets are much different than what you expected. Or maybe since you first approached them, they've been thinking about it in the back of their head and they may have some new ideas about, about what could be done that they didn't know was possible before. Um, you need to understand how they're currently working so you can provide a streamlined experience with added benefits. 
So if you understand their current workflow, then you can more easily see how and, and present to them how an asset management system can benefit, and then you can build those functions into the system so that they work for them. Um, ask them what they need most and what will be the most helpful to them. Most of the time, it's going to be information about assets, whether it's a credit line or a copyright information. Usually, I found an asset, and then they have to scramble around and figure out who has information about that asset, and that's usually the most complicated part. Um, of figuring out whether they can even use it. Specific requirements unearthed in the interview process may uncover new requirements or reimagine reimagining of previously documented requirements. So be sure to get input from all of the users. Um, this interview process establishes the priorities for your configuration. You need to align your sections. You need to align the department requirements before starting the implementation. Um, figure out where these different department requirements overlap and how do they fit together because they do. They always do. Um, whether there may be some specifics that people have that you can absolutely document, but for the most part, their, their needs are going to overlap. And finally, you need to document these requirements as use cases. Um, that is what you will be using to measure success and to provide guidance to your vendor for the configuration of your system. Um, and use cases describe processes and help define how specific desired functions are implemented. Use cases are not functional requirements. Um, these cases are also not work um, And here I just, because when I first started doing this probably, what, 10 years ago, I guess, um, I had a big problem with the difference between a use case and a workflow. Uh, I think that use cases and documenting use cases is one thing. It's, it's how you want the system to function and what you want it to do for you. Um, the system behavior as it responds to a request, which is different from a workflow. A workflow very often is a string of use cases put together. Uh, an example that I guess I could use is an image request and delivery process. So the way that a lot of places, that it works in a lot of places, before you have an asset management system is a staff request is made for an image. The search is on from multiple servers and hundreds of folders for high resolution approved images. The spreadsheet is probably cross referenced to go over to rights and reproductions for image approvals. If the image happens to be approved, then it's opened in Photoshop, it's resized to the desired resolution, it's loaded to a shared folder on another server, which is different from the server it originated on. And then it's probably copied to another folder on another server, maybe somebody's desktop and held indefinitely for future use, and then passed around to staff with no restrictions attached and no control over its use. So ideally, what you would probably want and prefer are images ingested into an asset management system, metadata auto-populated by your collections management system for Tombstone information, and indexed for search capability. Embedded IPTC keywords and information are also indexed for search at the same time so that in any embedded information in the asset itself can be searchable in your system. Your DAMS admin or your R&R admin adds use rights and restrictions to the metadata of the asset to control download and search capability. And then makes the asset available for discovery or makes the asset not available for discovery within the system. Um, meaning if it's an approved asset, then anybody can find it. If it's not an approved asset, then maybe it has a limited, um, a limited audience. And then depending on roles or permissions associated with the user's login, then they can download specific derivatives or request approvals to download a higher resolution image. 
Um, and that would be a long string of use cases. And that's and you put that together, I guess, as image request from A to B to C to D to all the way from request through to delivery. Um, other possible use cases are primary indicators and image order of how you want them to show up in your system, um, gathering and grouping of assets for research and how you want that to work in your system, um, discovery and search capabilities, what does that look like to you, what do you want your users to be able to do, um, define what a basic search does, define what advanced search does, define if you, how you want your search functions to, to work for you. Um, defining the metadata fields that you want to have available and how they will be populated. And image approval for public use also and how you want that to be indicated. So I've got five minutes left. I'm going to kind of cruise through the rest of this, I guess. Um, then after you have your use cases defined and you work with your vendor to implement the use cases that you are expecting, then you can finalize and agree on a plan with your entire project team and set up your first iteration, deliver your first beta implementation based on original documentation, common functions, institutional-wide requirements, and universal expectations. Um, Demonstrate the basic functions for all departments and how they share and use institutional data. And then, when you have your beta implementation, then you get people to start using it. That's when you get your pilot user group going. Um, document gaps and functional expectations by using that pilot group. Um, make them use the design functions specific to their department or specific to the whole institution. And Document anything that maybe isn't working the way you thought it was going to. And have them say, hey, you know, I really thought the system was going to do this, but it's not really doing this. And then you can build that into your second iteration, maybe a third iteration, before you end up um, launching the system to your, to your entire institution. Your first iteration is for working through bugs, documenting gaps and functions that you expected. Um, Another reason that the iteration part works a bit better than the Big Bang Theory, in my opinion. So, key risk factors, dedicated resources, we went through that, bad data. Everyone has bad data. You're going to have to separate probably your legacy data and your future data, and that's something that you can easily work through. Ongoing data cleansing is another role of your asset manager or your system manager. There is nobody who has absolutely perfect, beautiful data that they're going to be loading into a system. It's something that you would have to be committed to spending time and working through. Um, staff buy-in, training, and promotion. Smooth your staff. Talk up your system. Run some contests. Make it fun. Um, have them search for things and see how they search for things, and then whoever returns the correct information to you wins something. You know, I don't know. Make it, make it fun. There's ways that you can get people involved in what you're trying to do. Um, schedule. Fix to your schedule. Um, oh, that's that. I'm going to take my headphones off. I just got to note about the audio being inconsistent. So um, the longer you let your implementation last, the longer it is possible that the things that you want are going to change and your previous documentation is no longer valid. Um, so don't take too much time, ultimately. In budget, we all know that there's budget is always a risk factor. Um, OK, areas of focus. These are the things I guess I'm going to kind of cruise through. Assets and organization. Start small and work out the kinks. Prioritize your assets. You don't have to put everything in all at once. Start with the assets that you know through talking to your users that everyone 
uses the most. And there's always going to be an overlap between photography and you know, and marketing and press and PR and graphics. And it's, they're probably, you know, in my institution, they're exhibition-based. And, and just find the a specific set of assets that you can prioritize. Um, start small and work your way up. Know which assets you have and how to identify, organize, and describe them is always going to be a precedent, I guess. When you, if you know who the owner is of your original assets, it also will help you to remove duplicates. Um, at my institution, there are the majority of the used approved images come from our photo services department. They have at some point, whether it's a collection image or a non-collection image or an image of a building or a campus or an event or something like that, they have probably, they have archived that image and it exists in their archive and we started with loading their archive because that image already exists. The marketing department holds it probably for some of their use. The graphics department probably holds it in, in another place. Press and PR holds it somewhere. Development might hold it somewhere. And that is a good way to eliminate duplication um, as long as you can figure out who the owner of the original assets are and, and load those first. Um, because people will easily find them. And then they won't have a need to load them themselves once they start using the system. They'll see that everything that they already have stored on their own server, on their own drive, probably already exists in the system because it came from the original source. Um, they'll have the same assets, but they may have them organized differently to suit their needs. That's also something to consider when you're building and configuring your um, your categories and your search capabilities and your metadata. Um, use that information so that they'll be able to find the assets in the system in the same way that they have them organized somewhere on a server for their use. Um, define needed derivatives is also helpful. Um, the majority of the time, people will tell you I need a high-res image of something, but they probably don't. The opinion of um, of what a high-res image is, uh, is definitely different for most people. Um, I've listed here the standard types of derivatives that I use for still images. The original file is um, only accessible probably by photo services. And the high-resolution file is something that people can request um, use of. And standard press size images is what the majority of people use, a 2100 pixel JPEG, which to a lot of people is considered a high resolution image. PowerPoint size is a pretty standard. They'll be able to click on a button and say download PowerPoint, and it will um, be an image that they can automatically use right away that doesn't have to be resized. Web or email size is, um, it, you're just providing me the derivatives for um, for people to use for their for their purpose. Metadata and categories, which are critical for searching and storing of images. The better you understand your users' needs, the better you can design your metadata categories. Um, I'm going to skip through this a little bit and just, just go to this chart, which I had included as an example, um, but I thought might help some people in, as, as an example of what I was discussing before. Um, collection images versus exhibition images versus non-collection images. Um, anything that is in yellow is, is information that comes to the digital asset management system directly from the collections management system, which is the authority about these objects and about this data. I don't want this, this data is absolutely read only in my asset management system. So that, um, that could, because there has to be an authority on what exactly 
what information is exactly filled in for these for these fields. Um, primary classification is um, something that we are using in order to say in the collections management system, in the asset management system, or on our website, which image shows up first. Um, and we can, I can come back to this if anybody has any questions about, about how I organized this. Um, keywords and thesaurus terms. The thesaurus terms are um, controlled vocabulary, and keywords are taggable search terms that can only be added by um, power users of the system. So I need to wrap up. Um, define your users, roles, permissions, and security. I'm just going to put this up quick as well. So we have what we see are as four main users, um, a few that are admins, a few that are power users. Most of the staff is um, a user number one, and some external people may exist as user number two if we're doing a publication or if we need to get some images out to freelancers for something they're doing for graphics, et cetera. And this kind of says who is allowed to upload images, who is allowed to approve images, who archives images, who is allowed to view and download, and at what derivative they're allowed to view and download, and who is allowed to edit, add, and delete metadata. Um, because I believe that cannot be something that is only a digital asset manager because that's a big job. You need to have a team of people who know what they're looking at and who will have the ability to um, add, edit, and delete metadata in any of the fields that are available in the system that are not locked down, that don't have information coming from somewhere else. Um, because the more data you have, the more searchable your assets are going to be. Um, and finally, workflow design. As, a, as I said earlier, it's a string of use cases. And you need to work um, differently with existing legacy assets. And the thing that I would most focus on is how to work with new assets moving forward. You get to develop a new workflow for what happens before assets get ingested as well as after assets get ingested. Um, I just put a quick diagram up here about what a possible photo services workflow might look like. And this is all, all of the steps happening previous to an image even getting into the system. Um, so, and again, just as a sample, and it'll be something that's posted that, um, I, and I'm happy to share any other workflows that I've developed with anybody as well. Um, so I am wrapping up now, and I'm more than happy to open myself up for any questions or answers or anything anybody wants to share with me as well. All right. Thank you very much, Heidi. It looks like we have a couple of good questions already. There are a couple of questions about yeah, metadata I, schema. I, I cruised through that pretty quickly. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, That's right. That's why we have the Q&A time. Um, so what are the questions about metadata? OK, scrolling back to find them. So Elena had a question about um, picking your own metadata schema versus, off, versus using a, a standard one or, or customizing it to match your particular needs. Um, I would do some research, and I would probably find a metadata schema that you think most speaks to you, but you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to morph it to work for your institution. Um, just because it works for one institution, for the most part, Lots of places need to access the same types of information. However, they might um, they might tag them differently. And there may be things that your institution uses that is important for you and categorizing your assets um, that isn't important to 
another institution or another institutional type, um, a natural history museum versus an art museum, et cetera. There are, um, there are a lot of core types of metadata plans and taxonomies that you can pull from, but I see combining them into your own institution schema for what you need to probably be the most useful. Did I answer that? Yeah, I think so. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about, OK, so this is all, all well and good for well-resourced larger institutions, but you know, the point of the workshop is dams for small to mid-sized institutions. So how do, we, how do we translate this information and this, these practices into something that you can do if you don't have a lot of people, a lot of time, or a lot of money? And that's probably something for all three of you. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can jump in on the silence here. You know, I, I think this is where there's a lot of great things we talk about in terms of you know getting all the right players in the room, doing some really formalized project management around this. But one of the things I couldn't stop thinking about as we looked at this presentation is going back to this does not necessarily have to be an endeavor or even a tool or platform that has full institutional buy-in, has a full institutional strategy behind it. I think the, the challenges of most small museums is that they don't have the time, the bandwidth, or possibly the staff to approach it in that way. And I think this goes back to one of the questions that was asked after my uh, portion of the talk is, is, you know, can this be an iterative process? Can it be more of a ground up, uh, you know, or grassroots process within the institution? I think if you are a smaller museum, if you're, if you're limited in resources, that is a viable approach. I, I, I think some of the things we talk about that you want to watch out for in terms of you know institutional buy-in are important, but you know I, I would certainly say that you know doing this in an iterative grassroots type of process, maybe based on the needs of a particular um, you know even small department within the institution, is, is a viable approach for some small museums um, just to kind of get their feet wet and start understanding what a, a digital asset management system can and maybe cannot do for you. And it's just um, limit the scope of your project, too, if you can come up with yeah. one thing. Like, if there's one library digitization project you have, then you'd be like, this is what we're going to put. Like, this is the limit of the assets, and we're going to just put it, you know, just so people can view it internally. Sure. And I, I think it's important. I agree, but I, I mean, I want to throw out that I, I do work for, I don't work for a small museum. I work for a larger museum, but I am the one and only digital archive manager. Um, and it is a lot of work to bring all of it together for an institution the size of mine. But I can also say that um, that if one person can do it for an institution my size, that um, one person can, can spearhead a, a project for a small to mid-sized institution as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if, if, if the question here is, is so much as to whether a small or mid-sized museum has the personnel available to do okay. it, but I, I, I think sometimes what it often refers to, in my experience in smaller museums as well, is whether or not it fits into the bandwidth of overall strategy and prioritization of projects, right. uh, you know, more so than bandwidth, which, which I'm guessing is what some folks are alluding to here. There was one comment I just wanted to make that... Um, you know, part of the approach that we've done here at the Museum of Science as well is really on a departmental need. You know, our marketing and communications department really had a distinct need, and they were the first adopters and users of the digital asset management system. But we have found that other departments have had needs for it as well. Um, however, we realized that we could not globally agree on, or it would have been too much of a time stuff to globally agree on taxonomies and methodologies for the types of assets. Each department kind of had its own set of unique needs. The approach we took here, and it's actually been fairly successful, is we have a few unique departments that are all using the same digital asset management system, but are really kind of gated off within that system. They all have their same general, you know, they all have their own unique general set of assets that are important to their business function, but they use their own taxonomies and tagging that's relevant to what they do. 
some may look at that and say that's not an ideal circumstance, and I would probably agree with that. But I think you know this might be pertinent to some smaller mid-sized museums where you can't approach this as a huge institutional project. Uh, you know, I'm just putting it out there that you can have you know one tool that's serving some different needs and processes concurrently. Hopefully the silence didn't right. mean that didn't make sense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so does anyone else have any, any questions on uh, on Heidi's implementation strategy or should we just move on into the, the free for all of the hands on consultancy? Why don't we why don't we take a minute and just let people chime in, in the chat window? There were a lot of questions earlier that I would like to talk about that I'm not that I don't believe I addressed in in my presentation. Which I Right, so let's, let's give people a minute to, to give their questions if they have more for you specifically. I see there was one from Elizabeth about uh, wanting to know what dams LACMA is using oh, and what PEMP is using. So. Uh, um, I think getting, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Heidi, then Claire. <laughs> okay. Um, at LACMA, we do a lot of to TMS for our collections management system. Um, at the end of last year, we are using Piction for our digital asset management system, both of which feed through a internally developed API that feeds our collections online initiative on our website. So there's sort of a, a trifecta going on. Um, but Piction is our... Um, digital asset management system, which is integrated with our collections management system, which is TMS. The um, currently information from TMS um, appears in our digital asset management system picture for collections assets and for exhibition assets. And our, um, our non-collection assets are have metadata that's entirely internally generated in the digital asset management system. Um, eventually, we haven't, we haven't done the configuration yet for the images in our asset management system to feed back to our collections management system. That is our next scope of work um, that should be happening hopefully soon. And uh, Pam is getting a new content, or not content, a new collections management system. We're going to use Museum Plus. And as I understand, there are DAMS modules that come with that that we're going to be configuring to work for all of our exhibition images and in-house photographer images, that kind of thing. OK, anyone else for Heidi? Okay, in that case then, um, I'd like to thank all three of our presenters for being brave enough to put themselves out uh, and share what they have learned suffering through their own DAMS implementations. And I'd like to open it up to, uh, for a remaining half hour, to basically be for all for us to try to answer whatever questions you have on DAMS. And I see the chat window is already boiling with quite a few questions that people have. So. We'll try to tackle them uh, in the order that they come. So if you seem like we've missed your question, we probably missed your question and just re-ask it. And we'll, we'll go as long as we need to or until 2 o'clock, whichever comes first. Uh, so we had a couple of questions that I caught before about um, one from Elizabeth. I have one I'd like to address this super quickly from Christy. Um, yes, yeah, I sure. Did say, I did say that our dam feeds out to our website. Our um, Huge collections online initiative that LACMA launched. We have um, over 80,000 objects in our collections, um, in our, on our collections website. 20,000 of which are public domain images, um, and the public domain images have high quality assets that, that are available for free for download. Um, all of the over 80,000 images that appear in our collections 
website for all of those objects are fed from our digital asset management system. Okay. So, question for the presenters about um, comparisons of uh, popular dams out there that would be appropriate for small institutions. So, if you don't need the gigantic sized hammer, what is uh, what are different smaller hammers that are out there that a small institution might employ? I'll throw resource space out there. Um, you know, we use it currently at the Museum of Science. I used it at the uh, National Museum of Play. They're continuing to using it. Um, you know, it, it, it's a free product. It's got a great community. It's open source. Um, it, it's pretty easy to install, configure, and use, and pretty easy to maintain as well, um, and, and a pretty stable product if you're really looking for, um, you know, something that's not going to require a great deal of expense. Um, you know, I think resource space is a good option. I think I'm going to throw in a plug for fiction um, because they work really well with um, everyone that I've that I've spoken with. They do everything from um, absolute large institutions. They work with the Queensland government in Australia, but they also are working with some small libraries. From my understanding, um, their product I see as very user friendly and scalable. And um, I, I can't speak much as far as what their pricing is because I wasn't involved in that part of my process. But I can tell that um, they, they, their functionality seems to work well for something small as well as something enormous. Heidi, uh, apparently you broke up at the beginning of that. Could you just reiterate why you liked fiction at the beginning? Uh, because they seem scalable. They have clients that are enormous, and they have clients that are small little libraries. Um, they seem to work well, and they, their, their, their offering seems to be scalable to and, and configurable to whatever you might possibly need. Um, I, I've, I've worked well with them for the last three years. We started out small with our thoughts on what we were going to be doing, and we ended up way bigger. Um, with a lot more ideas and a lot more departments involved, um, collection assets as well as non-collection assets. They worked great with us when we wanted to connect our asset management system to our collections management system, which I've heard is a pretty complicated process for a lot of um, software. And they can say that Pixon integrates with PMS pretty, pretty well. Um, we, granted, I guess, I mean, I can say that from we only have a one-way stream going at this point, and we're working on the two-way stream for putting images back into TMS as well as pulling information out of TMS and making it available in picture. Okay, good point. Uh, we have a couple of questions about, um, let's see, Kathy asked a question about uh, if anyone has any information on dams that coordinate well with past perfect. And then Alan had a question about um, dams as software as a service providers. Does anyone have any any suggestions on either of those? I don't have any information. Yeah, the um, a lot of the open source, and you know, I've used resource space, and I'd have to do a little more research. There are there are outfits which will provide those as software as a service, um, you know, so, so they will host and back up um, the, the service for you. Um, I would have to do a little research and, and probably post a list of who some of those services are. They do exist, but I don't think it's particularly um, common. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure about most of the off-the-shelf software. Um, most software out there is making a transition from self-hosted to software as a service, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if a lot of the popular digital asset management systems, um, if they're not there yet, they're probably making transitions towards offering uh, their platforms under SAAS as well. Uh, yep. Okay, we have a couple of questions also about um, backups, which is something that a couple of people have referred to in passing. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, coming from a uh, kind of an IT perspective, one of the big benefits I think for any IT operation is 
you know, uh, forget about the use case and the necessity for the digital asset management system for the organization as far as, um, you know, what, what the main goals are. The secondary goal or, or tertiary goal for IT is always the fact that we are now centralizing a lot of these digital assets into one place. Um, so, so it's a big benefit for us to be able to have these in, in one database or one network directory so that we can swoop in and back them up. Um, I noticed some questions about methodologies. I don't want to go into a deep IT conversation here. Um, you know, I, I, I think using, you know, backing up to tape um, is a common redundancy, but one of the things our organization and some other organizations are looking at doing is backing up to cloud or even starting some collaborations between museums where we're backing up data to sister and brother organizations over the internet or internet too. Um, so it's, it's an interesting trend that's happening now and I'd be happy to talk offline to any museum struggling with backup and trying to figure out better ways to uh, back up their assets. Okay. Um, let's see. So Dale has a, a three-part question. Uh, which I think it would be good for all three of you to try to weigh in on about um, making the case. Yeah, I'd be, it really depends on your type of institution and what you're trying to accomplish. So I guess I would ask Dale, you know, where are you at? What kind of institution are you at? Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think making the case really depends on what type of institution you are, what you're perceived benefit uh, of having the system is. It, it's really hard to put a one-size-fits-all on this, but I think you can come up at least with some common, um, you know, return on investment scenarios. I mean, generally you're cutting down on staff time, you're cutting down on the misuse of assets, you're, you're making systems and processes more efficient. I think that's where you're going to find some of the common threads yeah. of making a case for asset management. Coming from the rights background, I think the most important thing for me is if you have an asset, then you need to know, do you have the rights to use it and who owns it? Because if it's just an anonymous picture on your desktop or in your server, then how do I find out who I need to go to for permission for this? Uh, it'll save you money, too, if you're not constantly going back to people to relicense an image again and again. Say you, you got a license for a year to use the image, and you know six months in, you're like, hey, I want to use it for five years or ten years instead. I want to use it for, I have permission for to use it in this book, but we also want to put it on the website. So, you know, going back and back to third-party rights holders like that, it, it wastes a lot of time. It wastes a lot of money, too. If you can ask for all of your rights in advance and know what they are and know when you need to re-up them, that's an important uh, cost. It also benefit. creates a robust and usable archive. So that yeah. if you have somebody who knows that you had a publication that was done 10 years ago and they want the image off of page 53, that if you find that image off of page 53, you can either, you can tag that image with the information that says it was in this, it was in this exhibition catalog and it was on page 53 of that exhibition catalog so that for some reason if anybody ever asks that question again, you'll be able to type that into the search and you'll be able to get that information back. Having the ability to have a robust, living, robust, usable robust, archive robust. is extremely useful for any institution. It, it creates your history. It creates documentation. It's not just a set of images that you want to put um, on a banner or a brochure. Um, it's also really useful for conservation purposes as well. If you have um, old images of collection objects and you can see, I mean, and it's going to depend on the photography and the color and all of that, of course, absolutely, but you can see, you can have images from an object from 40 years ago, from 30 years ago, from 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, from five years ago, and you, you would be able to, to view them simultaneously to maybe see the difference, if there is a difference, or maybe that scratch wasn't there before, why is it there now, or um, it's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a maintenance 
part of it also. There's an archive part of it, but there's creating an absolute robust and usable archive of your assets so that not only are you adding information for future use and you're educating people that may join your institution 20 years down the road, having that information in there for them and readily available and searchable and usable is going to make any process in the future easier and faster and better. Okay, I see we have a couple more questions, a clarification from Dale, and we also have a question from Elena about a, a couple of specific products, so if anyone can weigh in on uh, DSpace or Content DM or Mannequin. Anyone? Or I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, Elena's question about um, DSpace or Content DM, if, if any of you have any specific uh, thoughts about any of those products. I don't, I've never used any, either of them, so I'm out of that question. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately not myself either. There was, some, there was some chat going on about Content DM earlier. Yeah. I think the, the general consensus was that it was limited. And there was questions about you know, whether it counts as a dance or not. I don't know the answer so, to that one. Yeah, I don't know either, but I was just reading the chat. Okay, so this is one of, one of the places where the whole community out there is is going to have to step up as well. So do, if anyone anyone else is using these products, uh, you want to chime in in the chat so maybe you guys can uh, do point-to-point -point communication afterwards. And then if we can move on to Dale's question about... Um, I was reading, uh, I'm really trying to ask museum staff to create it, create it born digital assets being created daily and getting those into a dam. Are you meaning non-collection related or collection related? Yeah. Or both. Yeah. And are you looking for a workflow or um, I'm, I'm just trying to better understand the question. Yeah, my sense of it is if you already have a dams uh -huh. moving forward, how do, you, uh -huh. how do you go about getting all of those digital assets that are being created? Uh, so the thing that sprang to mind since they sit outside my office is, you know, we have all of our creative services people who are making, um, you know, we're doing layouts and publications and all sorts of other digital things um, every day, and how are we going to uh -huh. keep track of them? So I can tell you how I configured my system. I can't necessarily say that that's, that's something that would work for anybody or, or everybody, um, but I created... It, within my system, I have a, a collections area and a non-collections area, um, and I mainly separated them because they use different metadata sets, and there are different metadata fields available for populating information about those types of assets, because non-collection assets don't need artist title date, accession number, and that kind of information. So. In my non-collection area, I have an area for um, for photo services. I have an area for graphics. I have an area for press and PR. I have a area for web and digital media. And they each have a hot folder where they can, um, where a specific power user can put assets that they can then upload into their departmental folder that they control within the system. Within their departmental folder, they have a public folder, they have, and then they have a departmental folder, and they have a restricted folder, because I, I have the ability to add roles and permissions on a category basis. The folders themselves are categories, I guess. Um, so if they add information, if they, whatever they load in goes into their department folder and they can organize it in there however they want. And they can, and within the system is where they add their, um, their metadata into the designated metadata fields. And their, that power user is, is, is trained to add that information in because that's the only thing that's going to make those non-collection assets searchable. And then because they own the assets, 
they can either keep them in their department folder or they can move them to their public folder. The public folder makes it searchable by anybody, anywhere in the institution throughout the whole entire system. If it's in their department folder, then they can choose to share them with specific other staff, specific other departments, or to just hold on to it for organization or for use later on. And I'm not sure if that if that helps, but that's sort of that's the workflow that that I developed to work in my institution. Yeah, I think from my perspective, it's um, you have to be careful of that build it and they will come mentality. Um, simply having a dam and, and everything everything set up doesn't necessarily provide the impetus for people to actually use it and, and put their assets there, especially when we're talking on a daily basis. So I do think there has to be a bit of a cultural buy-in in any organization. Um, you know, two comments to your question that I would put out there is when we talk about, you know, how do we get staff to recognize that what they're working on daily is a digital asset and, asset and should be put into the system, I would say careful what you wish for. Um, you do want to be careful, you know, I, I, I mean, about defining the point as something becomes a viable asset to the institution. Um, you know, I, there you can very easily kind of muddy the pool by putting a lot of, um, you know, what may be considered assets into the system that aren't really full-blown viable assets. Um, so I think you have to define that within your institution. Um, you know, when you talk about creating assets daily, I, I, I definitely, a little antenna goes up there about do you do you really want, you know, daily iterations uh, of those types of assets in your system? And maybe you do. It's just a consideration. Um, I, would I think that's a good point, Mark, though. What yeah. is the difference between backing up a document versus right. classifying something as an asset. So is the InDesign file that the designer is working on an asset, or, is it only, or does it only become that at a certain, at a point when the thing is considered, quote unquote, done? Mm -hmm. um, and those kinds of things, I think everybody's going to need to answer for themselves. Right. I, I think one of the methodologies and pieces of advice I could give as well in terms of getting institutional buy-in and getting people to put stuff into the asset management system um, you know, is a trick um, us IT guys use, which is called, um, if you don't put it in, it doesn't get backed up. And um, it, that seems to work fairly well um, when yeah. people spend a lot of time working on things. Tell them that, look, we're not backing up your document folder. We're not backing up your desktop. But if you take the time to put your assets into the system, we can assure you that they'll be backed up and backed up redundantly. Yep, absolutely. That, that is a great point. Um, one thing I would like to just um, remind everybody, if you're following the chat window, lots of people are offering up their emails. Um, if you have specific conversations you want to have, so I would advise you all to capture all of those um, and make sure that, you know, that there are people who are happy to talk, that you, you, make, you get their address so that you can have that conversation, because that's really one of the things that this workshop series is supposed to help us get better at doing, is figuring out how we can be more communicative and share what we know with each other. Now, I also see Susie asked a question about uh, an earlier dam's disaster. Um, I don't know who wants to chime in on that one, so I'll throw it out to the three of you. Um, do you, do you have the same concern nowadays that she had back in the 90s with her system? Um, Let's I'm see sorry, here. I'm looking for where that question is. So the IT department moved the files to a new drive and renamed the drive. All the hyperlinks, the metadata hyperlinks, were broken in the database after that. So the downstate total update the links when things are moved. You know, I, um, you know, speaking from a, a long IT perspective on this, um, I don't think, Susie, that that's an issue with the digital asset management system. Um, at the risk of throwing some IT folks. Brethren, under the bus here, I mean, it, it, it sounds like the ramifications of moving something to a new drive and, and how that interacted with the data was just simply not considered. Um, so, I, you know, the short answer to that is if you're not working carefully and you don't have dependable IT folks moving things around, um, you can certainly still run that risk. Um, I, I have go one ahead. thing to to add in quick, I guess, is that those, um, in, in previous days, those hyperlinks that were created obviously got broken because you moved the assets. However, now in the digital asset management system, that hyperlink can be saved 
and held on to as metadata that can go that information itself can be saved in a field so that if for some reason it is ever moved, you still have the information from the original hyperlink. There wouldn't have been a way in previous systems in the 90s to actually copy and save that link and embed it as a metadata field in your asset management system. But there is a way to do that now. So you wouldn't ever lose that that link if for some reason you needed to go back to it. Metadata is like the in metadata fields and where however many you want to create and however many you want to save and wherever you want to keep that information, you can keep that information. It basically lives in a giant database and it, there's you know there's hundreds of cells and there's different columns and whatever you want to populate this column with for every asset it, you can absolutely do that and if you want to populate it with the links that you have generated from that asset to something else that is information that you can now save I, I think as a general rule technology technology gets better it gets more durable, and if you're referring back to an issue that happened in the 90s that was a disaster, I think you know the number of years that has gone by has, you know, ensured that a, a lot of those typical disasters of yesteryear are are, are much more. Um, you know, we can deal with them much better right now. I would also say that if that makes you skeptical about moving into the dam, I would like and I would kind of use the analogy that you know um, we're skeptical about using computers because we had a hard drive crash on us. At one time as well, right, exactly. so it, you know, I, I so don't throw out the entire technology set based on a, a particular disaster, but maybe just try to be cognizant of it and make sure there are some safeguards in terms of redundancy of data and redundancy of links um, and things like that. All right, um, presenters. I, I know one one question that got brought up a little earlier was. Um, you know, information specifically useful for smaller to mid-sized institutions. So, do you think there's there's anything else that hasn't really been gone over that would be particularly useful for people who don't have a lot of time, money, and a huge budget? Um, I just want to say it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be as daunting as it may sound. Starting somewhere is better than nothing, and starting small is even easier. Um, prioritize your assets. Find the things that people use the most and the things that you need the most information around. And it could be, it doesn't have to be every single collection image you have, although a collection is probably a pretty easy place to start. You probably have all of the information somewhere about your collection images already. Non-collection images is a whole nother ball of wax, and it's a lot more complicated, uh, and it's, it's a bigger process to work through. But collections images, because you have the information already collected somewhere about the object, is a really great place to start. Yeah, and just to add on to, to what Heidi's saying, um, even though we have just hired uh, a digital asset manager in Claire. We actually had a dams that's been up and running for several years that was completely done on on no money in spare time by one of our photographers who basically needed to have some sort of system to manage requests for photos. So he found an open source solution um, and built himself his own dams that he administers. Um, you know, completely outside of the usual procurement methods of, of the museum. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. And it, to reiterate Heidi's point, you know, he was very clear on what his needs were for a dam. So he needed to be able to track the information that people wanted to get out of him, like where is this photo? Can I get this photo? Do mm -hmm. I have rights to use this photo? Um, and these are largely photos that he was he or the other photographers were taking, although in some cases it would be, you know, here is the hard drive of so and so who just quit. Um, and it's got all of his files on it. Can you do something with it? Um, but in the sense that he was plugging in all of the information that was pertinent to him, that is a very good base that you can start from. Because then you can say that somebody else in a different department in the, in the museum would love to be able to have access to those images as well. But this is the information that they find pertinent to the images beyond what this 
photographer found pertinent, can that information be added? Can your data be expanded? Can there be more information available for the assets that already exist? Yep. And that usually just is, you know, somebody has to go in and put that information in. Precisely. All right. And I would say my, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I was say my advice for, you know, small museums is make use of the communities. You know, if you're trying to implement a technology, a process, a platform in your museum, um, you are not the first one to do it. <laughs> you are not the only one to do it. You know, at MCN, other conferences and other professional groups here, um, one of the things I love about the museum community is, you know, we're not competing with each other. Um, everybody is willing to share knowledge, to, you know, what works, what doesn't. Uh, so my advice for small, mid-sized museums is just don't, don't go into this alone and, and try to build everything from scratch. Make use of your colleagues and, and other institutions. And beyond that, the communities, you know, that surround things like open source projects. You know, we've seen a prevalence of Drupal for websites. You know, we've uh, seen a prevalence of open source uh, digital asset management systems. And each one of those are supported by, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of interested, motivated people who want nothing more than to help you be successful. Um, so I would say that's probably my culminating advice for small, mid-sized museums. Yeah, and to follow up on that, someone mentioned it earlier in the chat window, but I would reiterate, um, MCN has a very active listserv going, so if you wanted to go search the MCNL um, archives, probably all of these questions have been asked uh, at some point in the not-too-distant past about, um, you know, it, have, and has anyone used System X? What do they think of it? Um, you can get yeah. a lot of your answers there just by seeing what other people have have been asking in the past, or at the very least, you can mm -hmm. find out who's been asking the same questions. Um, and you know, and, and a lot of people that are kind of very willing to share their experiences as well. Yeah. If you don't find something that answers your question, then post your own question and say, "Has anybody used this? And have you tried to sync it with this?" Or you know, lots of it is active, and there are a lot of people that will help to answer your questions. Right, and particularly since this is still a relatively new endeavor in the field. I mean, I know oftentimes I wind up approaching questions like this thinking, oh, somebody must have solved this problem if I can just find them. And then you wind up finding out that, well, no, no one has actually solved your particular problem. You're going to have to solve it yourself. Um, but, but finding that out sooner rather than later. And if you do solve it, share. share. Right, share exactly. Um, I will say that there is a special interest group, and CN has a special interest group for digital asset management for, for, for dams in general that is currently not very active. Um, that is something that we would really like to get more people involved in and get more um, information and get more set up a, a, at least a better designated area where people can talk about and discuss their issues about and surrounding and questions about digital asset management in general. Um, so that is something that we are working on. It, it, there's a special interest group that does exist currently, but it is not exactly active. Um, so we'd be happy to um, to breathe some life into that. All right. Um, I see we are almost out of time, and we have two questions, one from Elena and one from Christy. Um, I see if we can try to address those before we have to go back to work. Um, that would be swell. Elena is asking about develop, uh, engaging with developer communities and software as a service. Um, anyone have anything to to add to that? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Which is, well, um, yeah, it, it's uh, you know I I think it's a lot of it is numbers and the need that's out there. Um, you know, I use the Drupal platform as a great example. You know, when it started out, there were some very common needs that people had that people uh, built modules around and co contributed to. Um, and then, you know, those have exploded into the hundreds of thousands of different modules. So pretty much any sort of capability you want in a you know, web content management system, you're able to implement pretty easily right now on Drupal. Um, I'd love to see the same things for, you know, asset management and collections management. Um, you know, I, I think we've gone down that road, but unfortunately, the community isn't quite as large. Um, so, so I think that's really the challenge. Is just we are somewhat of a a niche industry, um, but uh, hopefully, we can get there. 
Okay. Um, I I could answer Christie's about damn storage in the cloud. Go for it. That is um that is how LACMA does it. Our um we have cloud storage for all of our assets that are available in our dam system. Um and our dam system obviously also feeds our online collections. Um so um it has caused a few Issues, I guess not, I don't even necessarily know if they're issues. I mean, cost is the hugest issue for cloud storage for us at this point, and we've actually just agreed to um, bring our assets back in-house where we have a bit more control over our environment and a bit more control over our backups, et cetera. So um, we started out with our dams in the cloud, and our dams is hosted in the cloud as well on the same servers that our assets live, um, but we have, I'll just reiterate, we just recently chose to bring it all back in-house. So I hope, is that, I hope that answers your questions. If you have any more, then just contact me directly. All right, and on that note, I think um, I'm going to wrap it up and take the opportunity again to thank um, Mark and Claire and Heidi for sharing their wisdom with us. And thank you all for coming out. I'd like to put in one last plug for the uh, the final workshop in this first series of MCN Pro workshops. Um, workshop number five is going to be on digital project management. Um, if you go to the mcnpro.org site, you can read all about it. Um, and if people have any comments on how it went, we'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. Uh, and thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.